Property investing is a game of finance and you really need to understand how finance works to be able to continue your property investing journey. Um, this is one of the things that, that I learned as an investor very early on, that it's not just about buying a pretty property. It's not about buying the beautifulest property in, in Australia. It is about buying numbers. That is all you're doing. If the property doesn't hit that benchmark of where there is value in the area, then you walk away. Um, so for me, I need to understand the financial services behind things. So one of those major services is mortgage broking. That is the banks giving you money to be able to lend those things. So we had a amazing conversation with uh, an unreal mortgage broker that we love to get on the show. Last time we had him on was about 12 months ago and uh, he dropped some absolute bombs. Check that out in the uh, the channel, like and subscribe and all that nonsense. Um, but in this session, we learned all about interest only loans, principal and interest loans, um, understanding and breaking down exactly what an offset account is and how it works. How do we structure our lending? Because do you go with a first tier lender? Do you go with CBA? Do you go with ANZ? How do you think about structuring? Because if we're trying, if the goal, if the goal is to build a substantial portfolio, you can't just go out there and buy, buy a property with any kind of loans. Uh, we talk about trust lending. We talk about self-managed super funds. We talk about kind of buffers, how much buffers people should think about um, having in place. Uh, also, how to get finance after your 40s, 50s, 60s. How does this kind of happen? Um, and then how to find an investment savvy mortgage broker. That's one of the key questions I think is, is very important. What are the key questions to be able to get these guys uh, onto our team? Um, so we go through a whole heap of that, talking about LMI and, and uh, interest rates, all that kind of stuff. We had Aaron Wybrow of Strategic Mortgage Brokers on, and uh, it was an unreal session. Hey everyone, my name is Joe Tucker. I am from Oz Property Investors. Along with Jeff Miles, we created Oz Property Investors, where we have 70,000 plus property investing members, where we're helping each other grow and expand as property investors uh, and teaching each other how to build these scalable property portfolios. And each week we bring on a property expert and unpack the lessons that, that that they've learned over their career so that we can all become better investors together. So check out this session, like and subscribe, do all that stuff, and uh, we'll see you in there. Stay well. And we are live on Ots Property Investors. We bring the big names and we have the big fun and we've got the okay. top plan. How you going, Aaron? What's happening? Oh, I'm going good. Everything's happening. Lots of work. Lots of people buying properties. Lots of people needing lending. So it's lots of fun. Yeah. Wow, man. That's that. That is a lot of. I, I, I feel a lot of, a lot of energy. That's there's a lot of stuff happening in your world, which is fantastic. <laughs> it's good to hear a bit of bit of momentum and and things. So, I, this is going to be a great session. As as we say with most of them, we tonight uh, I've got somebody who's as he said he's got a lot of work. He's doing a lot of things. So. It's been almost twelve months since we've had you on, Aaron. So it's exciting to really? get you back into the into the saddle. Yeah, I yeah, know it was 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 March, May last year. But we're gonna. I, yeah. I want to round the grounds. What lenders are looking at? We're going to talk to that, and then we're really going to unpack some of the things that are absolutely critical on, to to review when you're looking to build a big pop, property portfolio. And some of those things will include what are the questions to consider about trusts, and and when you're reviewing your portfolio how what sort of things you should consider and how to action those and we'll finish off with it with a nice little dessert of of some questions you have to absolutely be asking your broker so i think that's a, a nice little property property main course little property meal we've got served course. up for tonight i thought we we're trying to be fit and not have dessert but anyway we'll, we'll see how we go we've, we've well, done our yeah. done our workout so you've got to treat <laughs> treat yourself and keep motivated that's 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 the way that's the way we that's roll here yeah. Today is your cheat day, everyone. This is how you get financially fit. You have a cheat day. You know, <laughs> why learn from why learn from your own mistakes when you can learn from the mistakes of other investors that uh, that have taken wrong turns in their property journey? Um, that's what I'm interested in, Aaron Wybrow. You you deal with a lot of investors. You don't just deal with. Um, you know, the thing is out there, I, I don't know the percentages. I'm sure you don't either, but somebody does. <laughs> that There are so many brokers out there that are there just to fulfill a loan. Um, and these are what we would call not strategic and not investment savvy. They just want to get you, you know, your little PPOR and they'll, they'll help you process a loan. They go for the cheapest rates. 
that is not Aaron and that is not someone that is an investment savvy mortgage broker. So I'm kind of interested to, like, I, the most interesting thing for me is unpacking what are the core questions we need to un, unpack and ask uh, to find out who is an investment savvy mortgage broker and how do we know if we need this person on our team or not? Because as you scale and grow a portfolio, it becomes very difficult to know who is on your team um, and who is who's qualified to be there to help you take that next level, go for that next step. And and Aaron, I think you're uh, I think you're one of these more strategic brokers, some would say. <laughs> so so yes, um we in in the business here we call all our all our brokers strategic brokers and we've oh. gone further to um, have the name business name strategic mortgage brokers. So uh, it just makes it easier for me to say on on a stage or whatever that you need to see a strategic mortgage broker and then uh, sometimes you go to Google and you might find me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, hopefully. So, oh, what are, one thing, actually, no, we've got a disclaimer. The disclaimer oh, is cool. we're going to talk a lot about finance. We're going to talk a lot about property. None of this is uh, anyone's personal circumstances. And then the other disclaimer that I want to put forward is Aaron and Jeff are both mortgage brokers, and they're going to go really deep into the real boring <laughs> mortgage broking stuff. So I am here to help support the audience and pull them back out when they get a little bit boring talking about all the numbers and stuff like that. A lot of it's valuable and important, but I'll be there to, to, <laughs> to rein this conversation <laughs> in um, and make sure that we don't get too former, boring. Uh, a former mortgage I mean, broker. Valuable, too valuable. Too valuable. So. I've not been. I've not been a broker in in seven years. So it's oh, wow. that's that's a lifetime ago. That that's before Ooh, even the last be. pandemic happened. But no, but no, it's going to it's going to be great. And and I think there's going to be a heap of value. And I want to see questions. If you're watching this live. Even if you're not, drop drop a question in watching on YouTube or if you if you listen on, on Spotify, do all that sort of stuff. Figure out where you can drop us a question and I will probably answer it for you because I'm a bit of a fiend with those comments. I'll do it even if it's just a, give us a hello. But no, so who is the person? The person in front of us today is Aaron. If if you've not seen him before, so you had you've had three careers. So you worked in intensive care as, as a nurse, medical sales rep. And now your your latest reincarnation is a broker. So we've sort of spoken about that a little bit in the past sessions. You do have an MBA though, a, a Bachelor of Nursing, and of course you've got your diploma Cert Four in, in mortgage broking as well. Um, so you and you've got a Cert Four in training assessment. So you've got a, a diverse array of skills to help everybody, as well as building your own decent sized. You're getting close to a double digit property portfolio last time, I believe. So you've got got some got some good runs on the board there as well. Um, hope you don't mind me mentioning that. Sorry, it's okay. Um, All good. All good. <laughs> Yeah, but and you're also the thing I love about you is you're the I don't see as much this day. You, you're the renowned mortgage. You're the mortgage broking bag. You're the bag piping mortgage broker. So, and you you've done a whole bunch of that stuff as well. So, how's that going for it anyway? Yeah, so uh, it, it, it's it's good. The bag piping. We we've had some um, uh, increases of staff and things, which has um, slowed some of that down. But I've I've maintained all the bag piping in the background. Uh, I've got all the normal events coming up with Anzac Day and a few other things. Bagpipes is my 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 out from work because it's quite a complex instrument. Um, if you've ever been uh, farther further away from the bagpipes, it's, it it's probably sounds quite simple. Yeah, I can give a crack at that. But as soon as you get closer and you see the fingers moving and the breathing and all that stuff, it gets more complicated. And I suppose that could be the same as some of the property investment stuff. Once you you look at it from the distance, ah, oh, yeah, we can do that big portfolio. And then you start looking at it closer and you go, what have I got into? There's a lot of finesse. Um, so we, we've sort of asked you about your first purchase, that sort of stuff. I want to understand mm -hmm. though, what is it? We haven't asked this before. What, what is it that got you into sort of finance and property? Like, why did you make the shift across, and what 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 um what created that passion, <laughs> sparked that fire? Yes, for you? So I I describe my career changes as a uh, like I've been crushed a couple of times with career changes. So. Uh, I was trained straight out of school as an adult and pediatric intensive care nurse. If you've ever seen the red button behind the beds in the hospital, I was the one that came running once you pushed it. Um, that then got me into pediatric ICU. So then I got pretty well, like when you start doing um, CPR or resuscitation on a child, that sort of crushes you a little bit. And then we, that uh, I saw medical equipment that wasn't being used. So I jumped into that boat, got the medical equipment in there, trained myself up in, in an MBA and found a lot of... Um, the some of your posts during the week there jeff were talking about and joe talking about people getting financial education during their career like i was a nurse i wasn't financially educated we didn't get it in school we got it didn't get it in my bachelor of nursing when i started doing my mba back in i think it was 
2008, 2009 area, um, I got into the financial subjects and I really liked it. Then I started self-reflecting and looking at my own stuff. And I found that I had a, a financial plan and mortgage breaking company actually frauding me. So oh, I geez. then went down the path of um, fixing that. And then I fixed how Couldn't I, I didn't want that to happen to anyone else. Um, so I became a broker and vowed that that never would happen again. Able to help a couple of people out of that problem back in the day around that 2012 area. Able to use my broking to be able to lift me out of that place and get me back into property myself. So um, I've, I've probably been crushed a bit like a grape. The best use of a grape is to crush it into wine. Uh, and I've got the analogies tonight. You, there we go. Right. Your little diamond, your little diamond in the rough. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So yeah, from, from bad things, good things happen. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's super like interesting. It. What? So a mortgage broker frauded you. Do you say? Yeah, so it was a, a, a dodgy investment um, thing where you use equity, get fake shares and do oh. tax variation statements and yeah, yeah. Okay. It yeah. was an uneducated time in my life, so I can tell you and sniff a, a probably dodgy thing a mile away now. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point because it's like you hear these tax savings and tax variations and it's like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Like one plus one equals two. This is perfect. We're going to, we're going to do it. And then you fall down the rabbit hole. You're like, whoa, this is so like the, just because it's complex, <clears throat> does, just because it's simple doesn't mean it's wrong. Like you, it, property investing does not need to be complex. You need to buy a good yeah. property in a good location at a good price to build a portfolio. Um, and it is just a game of finance and numbers. Um, that it's just with a couple of bricks and things thrown in the middle of it. So, so it comes to that you, as a starting out property investor, need to, to need to learn, need to research, need to understand things. Don't just take things willy nilly. Like, um, if you are not in a finance position, spending time on that, and you're in in the medical or in another field, like lean on on people that know know things. Learn. Like everyone's willing to talk about what they've done, how they've done it. Everyone loves talking about themselves. So get out and have chats. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think particularly in the, in the medical, and, and we'll finish up this point because I, I want to want to go around the grounds lenders. Mm. But I've heard particularly like a lot of doctors and even nurses are doing those sort of 60, 70, 80, 100 hour plus weeks. Hopefully not those 100 hour plus weeks. And there, there, there's a lot of sort of people chasing those professionals because they're only a good amount of money. And, and a lot of those might not have the most, the best, they might have ulterior motives on, on sort of selling off the plan sort of purchases. And I'm not, I don't want to bash them completely, but <laughs> in, in, in a lot of those circumstances, those people are purely there mostly for the commission. They're not there to help the, and they make it so simple and so easy for the, And I heard it on a podcast a couple of weeks ago, a doctor and, and yeah, so to, to your point, hundred percent, just important to be vigilant, particularly if you're a higher in, in a higher income earning position position and regardless of your position that it, it doesn't like spruiking doesn't discriminate against versus earning two million dollars versus uh forty thousand dollars they'll still sort of potentially go after uh, but yeah particularly in the medical sometimes it's, sometimes it's easier to like like these these type of people that go out there sometimes it's easier to you know con a, a a lawyer or a doctor because they don't have time to do the due diligence the appropriately and they just blindly trust the the, the dodgy dingo um so it is, it is sometimes, you know, more, the more experienced people, not experienced, but the more wealthy they get, they get kind of done, but they also get every, you know, everyday Aussies as well. Everybody, everyone gets With the, wiped yeah. by these people. It's mm -hmm. the, the marketing. The, the, the thing with uh, fraud and stuff like that, not to discredit too much or make a joke about it, but yeah, like everyone needs a Jason Stratham to come after him like Beekeeper movie that's just been released. It's all based on fraud and he just goes nuts after the fraudsters. So... If you don't know Jason Stratham, he's in all these action movies. In everyone. I, know, I, know, I haven't haven't seen, but I know all about it. So, but I, I'm I'm more of a I'm more of that. Mm. Um, the, You've the never seen a Jason Stratham movie. Oh, I probably have, but I don't know. I've, I've seen I'm, I've seen that um, that one where the the watch him anyway. So we 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 first up, we're going to talk about yeah. There's that bloody yeah. I, I, I want to talk about, I want to hear what's going on around the grounds in lending. What What is stopping, what are lenders focusing on? Because these are the things that people need to know. Uh, do we need to cancel our Uber Eats uh, obsession <laughs> or get rid of some of our our, uh, our streaming services? So what are those things, what are in, what's going on lending at the moment, Aaron? 
<laughs> um, so I, I suppose um, Uber Eats is a minor thing. You can start and stop that as you need to. There's always a place for something. And and living life is is an aspect that you should bring into everything you do, even in investing land and rewarding yourself too. So what, what are we what are we seeing um, in, in lending land? Um, obviously, everyone knows about the rate, rate rises in the last 12, 18 months there. We all know that some of the rates are on hold. Um, but what we don't know is what they do behind the scenes. So even though we've been on 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 hold for a while, um, some of the other things change in the calculators. A lot of banks are now online with their calculator. Um, a lot of them are in in little systems that brokers can see across um, across lenders. But they titrate things. They might change the um, household expenditure measure, even if you're below it or above it or wherever it is. Some some include um, all expenses in a big bucket, and some exclude. There's um, another thing, uh, the loan to value ratio. This is, the, this is that funky word that the higher you borrow, the more cash you can have, the easier it is to get to the next property. But what's sort of happening here is that once you go over 80% loan to value ratio with a lot of the major banks, not only are you going to pay the awesome mortgage insurance, you're also potentially going to have a 0.7 to 1% rate hike at the same time, as soon as you crack that barrier. I Wow. And on the, on it, the, is, on is the reverse with, side, yep. Wow, so is, is that with a certain sort of segment of lenders, or is that across no, the board? No, no, it's there's some, the the big ones, yeah. Wow, okay. that's a lot of money. Um, when you go that. under eighty, um, when you go under eighty, you get better rates. But also under seventy, we're seeing with some of the mainstream lenders, you're going to get a little bit more off. Um, and then um, some of the lower lower uh, rated lenders, non banks, banks, whatever. Uh, at 60 or under, you're getting even better uh, rates again. So that's a really interesting thing, but there's also a game to play with that to be able to get that to your advantage if you want to buy at higher prices and then look at how you can reprice your mortgages to help your borrowing capacity later. So time is a good factor there. Um, the numbers aren't one plus one equals two anymore. That's that's the whole thing. So we can't just go to a bank and some of the things that we have antics out there, like five times your income, six times your income to get your borrowing power, may not be the, the trick anymore. Um, once you've got a few moving parts, other debt, multiple properties, different structures, the, the one plus two at one lender could equal a million. The one plus one at another lender equals nothing. So there's Ooh. that multi-layered approach there about how we get the borrowing capacity because of all the factors in there. One bank might look at your tax return for all your property investment expenses and another doesn't. So there's a few... Um, things there there has been an increase in one of the things i was talking to a couple of senior credit managers the other day and they, they said a couple of years ago they wouldn't they'd see maybe one or two uh corporate trust applications uh, a week and now they're seeing a few a day so uh, that's been a, a really interesting thing and that's a, that's a bank that does onshore and offshore and they've had to um, recruit offshore to help assess some of those applications because of the load going through so that's a really interesting one um and the other one we're seeing is that this um whole in the, the snooker game with um including excluding trust stuff can be can have a bit of a subjective assessment on a on an assessor when you don't get things right on your submission um we do everything what that, to what make that, that right? right what does what that look mean? like so so you could get the wrong accountant's letter or the accountant put something different on there and that can change your assessment of your trust lending and inclusion or exclusion of such trusts. So whose responsibility is that? Is that mine? Is it the brokers? Is it the accountants? Like who's messing <laughs> up there? <laughs> so the, the bank has policies on it, but sometimes they don't let you know exactly what the wording is. It's up to the accountant or it's up to the right right wording. So it's um, knowing the ins and outs of, of that going forward. Um, the, the other thing we're seeing is a lot of people buying in a, in a trust and then buying in a trust again straight away. So sometimes having too too fresh of a trust and trying to exclude it can be a bit of a nightmare from accounting, personal, cash flow, the whole works as well. So that's um the older the trust, the better it is to be able to deal with it appropriately in Mandy. Right. So what are we asking? Who who are we asking what to make sure that we're <laughs> heading in the right direction <laughs> so so there's some templates out there there's some credit policies out there it's just knowing okay. what it is that you're doing at specific banks and every bank has a different template or a different yeah. way they want it worded 
Right. Okay. So, yeah, I guess this will tie into to um, some of the questions we ask brokers to understand because mm. that's going to be one of my ones. Is like, how do you understand trust? Have you worked with trust? What are you? What's your uh, your skill with trust? Have you have you got clients mm. that use them? Um, because, what, I, you, you're so you're so in, interested. In, I, I would even go broader. I'd say, what's your experience of helping somebody build a, a ten property portfolio? In so, how many clients have you helped achieve that? And then I'd go to say, anyway, yeah, we're, we're sort of unpacking some maybe some of the things. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanted to something that really whet my appetite or sparked my curiosity. Yeah, you yeah. mentioned something about there was a little bit with one lender you could have literally zero borrowing capacity the other was one million what what is mm. what are some of the what are the key impacts in your in someone's situation that that will mean that you get zero versus one million like what, are, what what's impacting that borrowing capacity so much yeah yeah so th- how do how do lenders compete this is the, the this is the age-old question like if you've got a um we we get it all the time if you if you're with a big bank like a, a nab a cba and you say the little old bank down the road is going to give me a better deal. They're going to say, we don't even compete with them. So if you get one of the big players and you compete with that, they'll compete. Um, obviously, these days, if you say you're going, they usually pay you off to stay. Um, I've seen that before. <laughs> it's still currently. Um, if you if you want to know how to get some money out of a bank, ping me later. I'll tell you what you need to do. Um, oh, gee. With, yeah, a bit with of- um. <laughs> yeah, didn't with, we, um, we wrote an email didn't we? we we did a newsletter with you Aaron. we did yeah um, but there are some banks at the moment if you put a discharge in and you get the right person they may pay you a few grand to stay hey i'll take it okay we talking about that in a live session no, well, <laughs> now they stop they probably stop doing that they go. <laughs> yeah. Good. yeah well we got yeah we got a window before this Good. goes before the the bank ceo <laughs> watches this and changes the policy <laughs> um, so, so then, so the diversification of lenders is a great thing to help your portfolio grow. So, going to restrictive lenders first, where they use a total of three percent buffer, they give you, they expense all your property expenses out, they do all that stuff, and they split it all up, give you all your bank accounts, is a great lender to go to because you've got a clean slate. You don't have any other lending, so you may as well go to the more restrictive ones first. As you go to these other ones where you may not have got any lending, so you've got the lending where if you do your borrowing capacity, again, you don't get any lending from that bank. But do you care? Because you've already got the lending from that bank. So how do you get more lending? You go out to the banks that compete with self-employed being one year's financials, using not a 3% buffer, but a 2% buffer on the purchases or even a 1% buffer on the purchases, depending on which lender you're going to. So that's the top line stuff. There's there's banks that take 70% of rent, 90% of rent, that changes people that look at scrutinize the tax return for extra expenses versus not. And then um, your household expenditure measure that some banks use. Now, a lot of, I know everyone controls their spending and we, we are fruit, frivolous in on what we do. But if um, on the bank's calculators, if you took a couple that had a say 200,000 and 5,000, $205,000 um, per annum income, the, across the lenders, you're going to go from, a base minimum living expenses of 4,791 through to 5,249. So there's a variance on <clears throat> how much the banks want to consider you on your living expenses. So um, that's let alone if you go over that, obviously they take that. But there's so many variances and so many buffers that even down to your credit card, like if you are one of those people that like those points and credit cards and all that stuff, like one bank will say, 45.5% of your balance, your limit is what we use, and another will say 38%. Oh, jeez. Is that much? Um, it's crazy that there's, there's that yeah, much. Um, that's, that. that's a little little bit of a difference. And then also when you get into some of the, the lenders that will give you more money because they consider the other bank's debt as less risk. So there's a lender that if you paid <laughs> $1,000 a month and you're borrowing only 80% with this lender, then they will only consider it at $1,000 a month. There's another lender that would do the 1000 the buffer, and then in the main, most lenders will go, what's your remaining principal and interest term? What's your interest rate? And what's your um, debt level? For investors, there's another bank that will do the 3% buffer and all that sort of stuff, but where the buffer is, they are funkier and they allow you to add back all the interest at the... Um, uh, interest <laughs> at the... Um, <laughs> of all your investment debt. So if they're going to consider your debt at 9, 10%, they're going to let you add back the interest at 9, 10%, even though you're going to be paying um, between between six and seven area. So 
those are the changes because if you go to one lender and they say no and another lender and they say yes, this is the power of your uh, investment savvy strategic mortgage broker. Mm. So what, um, okay, so COVID's happened and mm -hmm. we, we've kind of come out the other side of that. How, what's changing in, in lending? Is it becoming easier to borrow, harder to borrow? Like what, what traje trajectory are we on right now? Um, I, I, I think we're in a little bit harder, but with some strategy, you can get around some of the stuff because it's like any, any changes to tax or anything like that. So sort of the bigger income earners usually find a way around it where there's a rule, there's a, there's a, a there's a, another policy or a, someone that wants to compete with that in the lending space. Cause there's not just four lenders. Um, there's a there's more. So, and how do they keep Pete? They've got to do it on either borrowing capacity, interest rate, cost, um, structure, things like that. So that they've got to compete and that's that's where they are. From post-COVID and what's sort of changed, there's been some obviously significant changes in the self-employed space. Now we can utilize how the director of the business pays themselves versus looking at the business. Um, mm -hmm. We can look more at, there's more and more obviously always been there about um, recent financials to exclude some of the older stuff. Like there's even, so even when lenders are looking at for self-employed 2022 and 2023, even the back end or the first start of um, the financial year, say between June 21 and Jan December 21, um, is still in the financial year of 2022. So there's still potentially some grants and all that sort of stuff that still can come on the table with some lenders. So there, there's always um, there's there's been some changes in the self-employed space in the in the in the all, all the other spaces. I, I don't think has changed too much in regards to the banks are always changing how the household expenditure measure due to inflation. The interest rates are going up, obviously by RBA determinants and by their own uh, all that all that sort of stuff. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> when when do you think they're coming down, though, Aaron? I I, I actually I. <clears throat> The, I don't know if anybody tracks the US CPI, but US CPI was 3.1% last night, up from 3%. So I'm, I'm still very firm that I, I'd be surprised if we get one one this year at all. Like, of course, Australia is not the US, but I, I just think that last little, it depends on what the RBA wants to do. But what, what are your thoughts on, what, what, do, you, so, what do you think the tea leaves say, to, Aaron? Here's, here's two ways to think of the question. Like, uh, interest rates are a structural thing. So considering your property portfolio and acting now, not now, depending on your circumstances, shouldn't really be a, a factor of what the RBA is going to do. It's about what your personal circumstances are and how that impacts you. Um, the other way to answer the question would be, we've got a couple of things happening that are outside the RBA's control. So number one, they've reduced how many times they meet per year. Uh, number two is that we've got this stage three tax cuts in whatever fashion that they want to manipulate and change it and do all that stuff around with. They've got those tax cuts as well. So would the RBA change the rates or would they wait for what the effect of the stage three tax cuts are? Because you're going to put more money in the market and the whole point of interest rate rises is to get it out. Um, so will they will they hold? My, my gut says they'll hold and see what the tax cuts were going to do. And then they will there's some other pressures I believe that should push some downward pressure on it or on hold pressure. I don't know what the timing is. I don't think it's going to be cutting back to COVID levels at all. You might see a half, you might see a three quarter when it comes. I don't know when it comes, but from a property, property building portfolio point of view, if you're worried about when the tax cuts come, that's where everyone's worried about. That's where, when it comes, everyone's going, cool, I've got more borrowing per capacity. <laughs> Capacity. capacity so so they're going out there but the people that can do it now maybe they're the ones that can capitalize on selling the properties to them when it comes there you go interesting okay so so eh, no, no, not much changes um one of the one of the big changes that that came in with with apra was um a, a servicing buffer where they threw oh, yeah. on a, a, a buffer. So we were Jeff and I were actually having a, a chat with another person that's coming up. And what was his debt to income service ratio, Jeff? Um, it was it was close to twenty times. Um, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that, that was using the that was when there was no. This was we're talking sort of 2015, 2016. This was I was starting to consider that sort of buffering, even with the major banks. And then he was going down to some of the second and third tier lenders to max out up to that sort of 20x his 
and he was then sort of cash flowing it with yeah you'll hear the story next week but yeah it's just Such interesting isn't it it's a, an awesome it's point you bring up with, with with the buffers like before covid we were stuck at like a, a 7.25 because the rate was about average and 7.25 was the floor to be considered for new lending if you went if your interest rate was sort of close to the seven it went up by a couple of percent to qualify for the money but when when um COVID hit and the rates went down to two or even down to the one nine nines or two the early twos 7.25 wasn't going to cut it in that current environment at the circumstances of the day so they changed it to a floor rate and a and a buffer and what we've happened as we come out of COVID, that buffer has remained and that buffer keeps going up. So the rates go up, the borrowing capacity goes down. The tax cuts come in, more money comes to the net income, borrowing capacity goes up by say anywhere between five and 10% with the stage three tax cuts. With the interest rates dropping say half to three quarters, that's gonna put a lot more um, borrowing capacity back on the table. So those two things combined together could, could spark a little bit more of a um, borrowing capacity availability to people that have the dormant equity or the the need for borrowing going forward and have you seen a correlation between opening up of borrowing ability and property prices no oh wait a minute when when the rates were going down do does property go up is that what you're asking well, no, like when borrowing, because interest rates going up, if there's a difficult servicing buffer, it doesn't actually, you know, that doesn't make it easier for borrowers, but property prices have still increased. But if borrowing, if you can borrow more money, right, like when interest rates start to drop, um, is that going to open up more people willing to borrow, able to borrow to then mm. spend more so money on, on property? So, so this is where maths versus sentiment of the market. So maths mathematically would put more borrowing capacity out there. But do you, I don't think interest rates are correlating to property prices. I think there's a two, two separate things. Um, because even if it's difficult for the borrower, it's potentially not difficult for other people that don't need borrowing or uh, are in a different set of circumstances, income or the magical servicing calculation ways. Um, having more money and available to money like is everything crashing uh, what what about the sentiment what's the risk factor um are you ready to go are you not ready to go you might be able to borrow. there there are people probably out there that can borrow millions of dollars but they think potentially everything's going to crash or yeah. if the interest rate changes downwards like what's your risk factor sentiment um uh, there, there was some posts i saw like uh well maybe the wife doesn't want to go into property maybe you do um those sort of things come in. So because you've got the borrowing capacity, it doesn't mean husband. everyone uses it. And it could be the yeah. husband, absolutely. The post I saw. That's, um, Joe, that was that was a grenade question, man. Like just, you didn't even yeah, didn't prepare for that. Like I would I would like he, you answered that amazingly. Oh, yeah. Well done. Well, um, well, so what, 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 well, that's, that's, well answered. Um well yeah, before yeah. we go into the next section, I realize we've got to run this uh this yeah, go, the, this this oh, fantastic, yeah, fantastic ad. Um and then Jeff, what are you gonna ask? What's the question? Leaders I want to know. So we, we we need to talk about being financially fit. So what are the things that what are the things that people need to factor in when they're applying for finance? What we came here to talk about tonight? What are we bloody here to yeah. talk about? Let's I'll, do it. I'll, ca I'll catch my breath from Joe's question. Bombshell. <laughs> There's nothing worse than going into a situation unprepared, especially when that situation is purchasing one of the most expensive assets of your life against a trained property expert in the form of a real estate agent. It's a scary thought, but it is a skill that can be taught. Do you want to learn how to become fully prepared when buying a property so you can get out there, buy your dream home or investment property without the fear of actually messing it up? Scott Agate, the founder and expert property negotiator at Hello House, has been helping people buy their properties by stepping in and negotiating with the agents and saving his clients tens of thousands and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars. Scott has now decided to share all that he's learned over the past 28 years in real estate so you can go out there and do the exact same thing on how to find a property, analyze that property, negotiate on that property and transact on it to get the best results. He's created the Get Buyer Ready course which is a step-by-step -step guide on how you too can become an expert property negotiator. It's the easy way of how you can avoid all of these agent games and get the best purchase price on that dream home or your investment property. The course is in short bites for busy people with no fluff at all. Just all the information you need to get buyer ready and secure that next property with confidence 
at the best price. Scott has been kind enough to give our community a massive discount with the link below. Sign up today before you even think about putting an offer on that next property and it will be one of the best decisions you ever make. Ever make. Happy days. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, no. The reason oh, the reason I ask that ask that question is because it's a question on everyone's lips, right? Absolutely. Um, but it's also it's also interesting about these serviceability buffers that are getting spoken about to drop. So not only are interest rates on the horizon to to level out and and drop down, but also they're like, hey, well, what are we doing about this serviceability buffer? What? what why is it at three mm. percent? What are we doing? Can you talk to that a little bit? I feel like we kind of brushed over that a little bit. But do you know? too much about um, that and what they're thinking and how that is going no. to affect things. So, so banks want to lend money. Like they're in the business of lending money. Like they, they post their profits. They love their profits. Why, why shouldn't they love their profits? We should love our own profits out of our own bank profit portfolio <laughs> as well. So mm -hmm. the, the, the buffers, obviously when it's going down, the buffers had to change to, to meet the expectations of the, the time, like the sentiment with COVID around and all that sort of stuff probably spooked a little bit but there's a lot of people that made a lot of a lot of money out of covid too because they didn't not just look at the health things they went after the property there's as it's gone up the buffer's gone up which has decreased the property uh the borrowing capacity but also we found that um self-employed people have made a lot more money and other people have got promotions and all that sort of stuff that helps that and the, the buffers as they got up higher there was um are the, are the banks able to still lend money are we still going to continue the the volumes that are going through to all that sort of um uh, maintenance of the, the the market so to speak and then the minor banks were were getting undercut or they weren't getting undercut there's a lot of like marketing and sales stuff out there but then right. they started changing the buffers so where people couldn't achieve the refinance so this is where the mortgage prison conversation has a big factor in what the buffers are. So there is a lender that if you are can't get serviceability with everyone, you've been with the lender for 12 months, it's at a high interest rate and you want to reduce it down and you don't want to meet the serviceability buffers, there's a lender out there that if you've been good with your loan for more than 12 months, you don't need to do the servicing. And as long as it costs less to go to them, bingo, you're done. With other banks, their response to the serviceability buffers to get you out of a high rate loan to a low rate loan which can be part of your portfolio journey, like you might acquire with different products. And then when you're consolidating it down into better products, you might need these refinance buffers where you can reduce the buffer with say, some of the majors like your NABs, your CBAs, your Bank Wests, and all the other ones where they'll reduce the buffer from 3% to 1% due to just refinancing. Is that that's so, on owner occupied only though, or is that investment? No, as well? no, invest, investor as well. And there are some banks wow. that will allow you to get up to about 50 grand cash out as well. Some banks will won't give you. Has, has yeah, that been some banks will, No, no, it's it's been around. You can get up to about fifty grand out by using the reduced buffers. Um, okay. Some banks will only allow for principal and interest. Some banks will allow you the interest only as well. So, um, the the one that doesn't need servicing it will allow interest only as well. The one that they 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 do have a bit of servicing, they just reduce the buffer. That that's there too. So. The, the mortgage prism was one of those topics that you don't want people that may have had a low dog loan or a, a loan to get out some credit problems to be able to be stuck in um, the, the nightmare of where their rates are going because some of those rates could be nearly up at tens at the moment. Interesting. There you go. Yeah. Okay. That was comprehensive. Like you, you, you don't do things in half measure, that... Aaron. You, re you really answer the questions comprehensively. It, so... did, did, I, did I hit you, hit the nail on the head there, Joe? <laughs> I get all the reps out, mate. I, I've run out of run out of curly questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I still got some. Don't worry. Um, okay, financially fit. What the hell does financially fit mean? I saw you in your spandex. Um, you seem like a man that is very financially <laughs> fit, and uh, I bet you see a whole heap of people that are not financially fit as well. Property investors that come up to you. Um, what are some actually? What are some of the non financially fit things you see people doing? um that yeah and a little less obvious uh so that we can avoid them as financially fit people what's the mcdonald's of finances <laughs> what's the mcdonald's of finance what the, so um what what do i see that's bad is that where we want to go to the bads and get the get yeah, the let's go for, what's the shit we shouldn't be doing yeah so i see a lot of um stripping equity always going to 90 percent without a plan no we've got to go to 90 percent. that's what everyone does 
let's just strip that equity out, keep going. Right. And we can find that that's an interesting one. Um, and it doesn't always work. Um, the people don't want to pay their debt off. Okay. They just want it as interest only about- forever. Oh, yeah, okay. okay. I thought you might have talked about hex debt. I suppose well, these are, these are things. Off. These are things that 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 I think about. I hear people, you know, building and scaling their portfolio in the accumulation phase are the things that they're doing. They're not paying mm. off their debt. They're going interest only. They are building and and ripping equity out as soon as they can to be able to acquire as much of a portfolio as quickly as possible. So the, there's there's a there's a plan, and then there's yeah. I mean, no, um. There's um, other debt outside your mortgage. That's the key. That's the big one I see. Um, the things that, oh, uh, yeah. So you might get a car loan. Let's get. We deserve a car. We d- we deserve that takeaway coffee, don't we? Um, so well, let's. The, why should we pay the debt off? There you go. Yeah, Good I kind of want to unpack that because I mean it's it's an interesting question. Why why should the debt be paid off and I mean, I'm interested in your thoughts. My my thoughts are that eventually, at some stage, a bank is a lender is not going to allow you to keep extending out that interest only period. And once you get to sort of 45, 50, it's not saying you can't get interest only, but they're going to say, okay, look, yes, like we might be living till 80, 85, whatever we're living to now. We're living a little bit longer. But at the same time, you aren't going to live forever. Unlikely to live forever unless somebody invents some kind of freezing thing and. A, a, a devoid of that so they, they want to because ultimately yes the, the property may be going up in value but at the same time you, you, your ability to earn income you need to sort of extinguish that debt and if there's not a plan there then why, why should the why should the lender take a risk on that thing but what are your thoughts on why should the debt be paid off so i i, I love it i i, I go out and it's probably the Probably the secret is the baited question: You should pay off your debt. I mean, you know, actually, how to how to generate your borrowing capacity is actually to have less debt. That's a, that's a pretty simple way to do it. Um, there <laughs> is um, obviously you balance it with income as well. The the other one that's a bit bit loaded too is that should you should you sell your properties to be able to extinguish debt and help you scale as well. That that's another one that's that can be a bit painful to pill to swallow too. So numerically, paying paying off your debt increases your borrowing capacity because you go re-borrow it. Um, you could have the whole debate conversation about inflation and eroding debt and all that nice stuff, in, rents going up, incomes going up, property values going up. But what if you had the goal that you actually wanted to retire on a passive income? Uh, and that's the question. What's better than an investment property with a home loan on it is a investment property without a home loan on it as you're going to retirement. And, and you're right, Jeff, if you have a 30 year mortgage, it's actually 30 years, it's not infinite. Yes, we can refinance and do all those nice things. And if we've been um, having our, our loans at 90% right up until age of 60, and then the bank goes, how are you going to extinguish this debt to be able to give you the 30-year mortgage on your dream home that you need? And you can't answer the question, then not potentially going to grant you that. So it's a balance. You don't have to pay down your debt. You can pay down your debt. And you can increase your income. So it's not that why you should pay down your debt and why you shouldn't pay down your debt. It's about what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. When are you looking to do, to make those things happen? Because a portfolio being built is in stages, right? Like mm-hmm. it isn't, it isn't just like, I see a lot of people like going into commercial and, st- you know, we have Steve Polisi as one of our sponsors uh, because I think commercial is a part, it w- will, should, should be a consideration for a lot of people. Um, but should you jump into commercial as your first investment property? I don't think so. I think you need to build up. You, you do what you want. I'm not giving anyone financial advice. But um, you can you can see where people get stuck. They're like, oh, I need to do all of these, you know, 20 things first. But it's like, no, no, you've got to do it in do it in phases, right? You've got to start accumulating the assets first, building that equity in there. Uh, and then, you know, you're not going to want to just have, like, you can't retire on debt. Like you can't retire on um, equity, sorry. You can't just have $3 million worth of capital, but it's costing you $300,000 to pay for it. That's probably mm. a pretty terrible life. Yes, you're a millionaire on paper, but you're losing 300 grand a year. So how do you combat that? You have uh, strategies, I guess a finance strategy to get out of that situation so that you can then, yeah, pay down, pay down. People, love, people love the old ETFs apparently, I suppose. Um, no, no, but... <laughs> 
what 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 I was um what what I'd love to hear is imagine we've we've gotten sort of two or three properties and I did uh, or whatever properties we've got I I did a sort of a strategy review chat with you recently and just a, an unpacking. Mm. But you're interested to hear what are the sort of things when somebody catches up with you, what what's uh, what aspects do people need to do to then make themselves fit to be able to borrow again and keep building that bigger portfolio if they choose to do so, Aaron? Mm. What are the core aspects of that so, process for you? You've got to you've got to review your your portfolio. So um, everyone talks about a bit of an acquisition phase. Everyone loves the the buzzword about consolidation. Um, that you've already thrown out other words with commercial versus trust versus structures versus pay down debt. We that's a, a, or sell properties off restructure and all those things, and they they come in in time. So acquisition can be quite a, a, a quite a messy approach sometimes. The first property is always the hardest. So. When, when I am able to sit down with a client for, say, six months or 12 months in, uh, it's like, if you haven't bought something then, like, what do we got? You've, you've got your properties there. What do we got? Is it maximized on the interest rate? Do you have the right products active? Um, did you, you didn't need the offset account to begin with. Now you probably do need that um, because you've got your owner occupied mortgage under control and now you want to manage the interest on your investments. You, you might need interest, interest rate reviews. What does that mean? When, so, What's that? Hang on. Uh, what do you mean ab about the owner occupier and um, the investment? Why would we? Ooh, not... yeah. Let's talk to that. Let's pinpoint that one. So when you've got an owner occupied debt, it's not deductible. So using redraw can be quite an a good cost saving. So a lot of the banks with own offset accounts could charge you like four hundred bucks a year to have an offset account or a package. Um, some lenders don't can't can't den deny that but redraw can be quite a cost effective saving on your non-deductible debt but when you start getting deductible debt like your um your your investment property offsets become a little bit more powerful as a product around the lending right can i, can I challenge you a little bit or not challenge but the the redraw concerns me a little bit because mm. and, and not that, the reason is like you saw me bank actually started to take back <laughs> some totally. money in the redraw so I, I don't trust the redraw products to be and and it's not mm. probably not the first time it's happened and i'm sure it won't be the last so how do you i would rather have that 395 dollar package fee per year for ease of mind to know that i can access that money like how do you well, that, 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 that? that's the strategy like if you have three hundred ninety five thousand, I, I think the calculations are around that plus or minus a little bit of money maybe around 10 grand sitting in your offset account will offset the 395 dollars. so if you've got that ability there you go you got your option to have either way depending on your sentiment but if you've got yeah. your owner occupied mortgage you should probably try to hammer that out as quickly as you can one of the strategies is to go after some property with your owner occupied equity to build up assets and then sell them, use the rent, whatever it is to pay down your owner occupied, but you actually own the money. So um, on, your, on your owner occupied debt, why don't, why don't we um, just, just pay it down? Like there's also the, the psychology of money. Like you can, if it's in your redraw and you have nothing in your bank account, uh, wherever you are, like you have to stop spending to then go and log in and transfer money. So it can what help about? you with your spending habits too, related to redraw. What about the offset? star on a Saturday night? Not that I do that yeah, very often. In fact, I couldn't even get in there last but, time because you can't get so, in there if you're a new stuff. Yeah, you can't but, go but, and spend those, that extra hundred dollars at a roulette table. Not that I do. That's that. right. Do that. Those with, with the Me Bank or anyone that gets in the media about that stuff, um, they did reverse their decision. So, but Pretty those quick. that control the goal control the rules. So, um, <laughs> and and. I'm not sure how many people read their Apple terms and conditions on the latest iPhone or, or Samsung or read all the terms and conditions Facebook. that are in your mortgage these days. And mortgages, when you're approved, come on DocuSign at some points in time where they just flick across to where you sign versus the reading. So I encourage everyone to read their their documents. But um, they, they can they they could take they could turn off offsets. They could turn off redraw. They they could do a whole range of different things. But mm. the market wouldn't like that. So mm. redraw versus offset. It's a redraw and offset can work quite well for owner occupied, but um, offset does work more powerfully in investor land. Yeah, so you it's fine to kind of start as your PPOR. You just get it. You you know you're in your thirties or forties. You've bought your PPOR. The whole thing has been, hey, I just need to pay down the debt on my PPOR, and then all of a sudden you've heard about this whole investing thing, and maybe it's a good idea to consider an investment loan with a uh, uh, an offset, so you can do that. Um, That's right.
It's yeah. Okay. It's and that comes into it. structuring. It's not, not necessarily that I'm not an accountant. I'm just a, a, a mortgage broker to be able to structure it. Right. It's about structuring and where and confirming where the offset accounts are linked to uh, and making sure they are linked. So there's a lot of, uh, you could Google a, a and Z and the offset account thing. You could Google a whole range of people. They, they didn't link them right and lost millions of dollars. So you've got to, you've got to take control as an investor when you're using uh, other bank accounts linked to mortgage products like offset. So Oh, it's so um, annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I just, so, I just so shifted taking, banks and trying to link a freaking offset. Like I went to the broke. They're like, oh, it's under two people's names. So I went to the bank, created a two people, like a joint account. They're like, no, you can't offset a joint account. So now I have to create an individual's name. But they're like, you can't because it's two people on the loan. You got it. So they make it so complex sometimes. <laughs> just, just, just get, I think, it did. yeah. I know. Solution this is a. Like if you look at it, look at all the nitty gritties that a lender puts you through to get the mortgage, to get the property investment, like how much do you really want your portfolio? So you're going to have to go through the pain sometimes with the with the lending to to get it. Um, um, okay, so I feel like we've made a little confusion because we've gone deep. Oh, I okay. said we would pull, I'd pull ourselves out, <laughs> and mm. I dived straight in with you into this nerdy <laughs> mortgage broker number thing. So I apologize. So let's just get so let's just get clear. So so offsets attached to investment loans. So. Mm -hmm. The, the ultimate goal for me, I'll just talk about me, is to pay down my owner-occupied debt as much as possible. So I will put all my savings, nest egg capital against my PPR because it's, as he, this person says, it's tax deductible well, for interest. In, in, in an offset, well, though, you're not tax. actually paying. You're not paying down the. You're not paying down the principal. You're reducing the amount of interest mm. you're paying. So it's yeah. So I, I like where you where you yeah, both but a non going. interest. Yeah. So yeah, I know I, what you're I saying. Like you're... They're saying they're saying offset attached investment, and so in an offset. No, no I think it's more of saying should I have an offset against my my investment, um, as yeah, opposed to off my PPOR. Oh, so, so where yeah. are we storing? Okay, yeah. we all where, have savings. We're all savings, we're all savings. savings yep. for our next. Where are we storing our savings? So I've got 400 if, grand, let's just say. If you're not, I'm, you know, if you're not doing any other, we're just doing property, and you've got your own place. We want to store it in our own occupied mortgage. And the two options we have is redraw and offset. When we've got that under control and we want to offset interest on our- What does investor, under control mean? What does under control, under control mean? Paid off. Um, Completely. Total, total offsetted. Um, everyone's definition is slightly different, but if you just take the mathematical, it's totally offsetted. It's um, fully paid off. Um, and yeah. maybe you've still got the mortgage open. When you get to the investment, and this is where you can go to the next level and dive into the nerd space in trusts and super is that when you, when you pay down your um, investment debt and then you take it back out for personal reasons, it's like you've paid it off. And now that component that you pulled back out for personal reasons is now not deductible. So where this is where, if you can separate the loan to a bank account and have money stored in an offset account for your investment, it's not paying it down, but it's saving you interest. I might have to read. I think that's clear. That. Is that clear, Joe? So, no, according, you have to rewind that and listen to that again. So, but it's so it's take the hundred grand. If you have a hundred grand owing and you have a hundred grand in your redraw, no interest charged. You have a hundred grand in your home loan and a hundred grand in your offset account, no interest charged. One's a bank account, one's the home loan. Boom, baby. We got clarity. That's all we wanted. That's all we wanted. I, I don't. Good. I don't think it's. It's not. It's not us, Joe. It's you in the situation. Sorry, I think it's mate. me. Um, <laughs> and then the <laughs> next level on offsets. The next level on offsets. You can put offsets in a trust, and you can put offsets in a super fund. Yeah. Yeah. Geez. That's, okay. Uh, yeah. That was probably one of the one of the questions I wanted to ask about this this sort of ability to build a big property portfolio. What are the little known or, or lesser known things that are really powerful that people aren't doing that they should be doing more of to be able to borrow more, Aaron? Yeah, cool. So we talked about that 90% to 80% potential change in interest rate. So yep. if you want to get a little bit of a little secret out of doing something without necessarily needing to refinance your loan, if you've had to acquire a property at 90% um, 18 months, 24 months ago, it could be in your best interest to revalue the, the property because you're paying at 90% interest rates. Say, ah. pick, pick on uh, one of the majors, say you're picking, you're paying your owner occupied at 7% because you're at 90% lending and now your values changed. So you're now considered at 80% and your interest rate can go from seven to say close to six. 
that can change your borrowing capacity for your next property without needing to refinance. Very true. Yeah. And right. that won't, that'll literally, because you could probably even do a, you could do an automated valuation, couldn't you? You wouldn't even have to do a full, oh, you that's might right. do a full you, value. You could, that's so you could, you could go back to your broker to ask the valuation. Most major banks give it free to them, free to you. You could go to bring them up and give them, give them a, a bash up to see what you can do. And then um, how do we do, like what causes us, like are there things that we can do to increase the equity quickly that you've seen in your investor clients to be able to, to do that, right? Like you, I bet you see so many people getting an 88% lend and it, maybe we'll talk to that because I think that's important. Um, an 88% lend or a 90% lend and then they're like, oh, I really need to get this rate down. Like what are the things mm. that you've seen to quickly do it? What's the, the speedy, quick, quick way? <laughs> the speedy, quick, quick way. Um, well, if it's investor, you probably want to keep the debt. That's what we were just having questions about before, whether we pay down yep. the debt or not. If you want to keep the debt, then it's about um, looking at what you're going to improve for the uh, valuer to improve the value. So this is the rabbit hole of valuers, which is a, a, a bit of a, a minefield. But if you settle on a property, say, today, and then you paint the joint, you renovate the joint, and you put a new tenant in there, it doesn't necessarily translate that you're going to see that gain in a month's time, two months' time. Yep. Yep. So it's going to have to, it, like property's not an elevator, it's a staircase. Like you've got to wait. So if you're going to do the things that improve the value to get the equity, to get the rate down, you're going to have to give the time. If you're also the first property in the market that is at a higher price and you're waiting yeah. for it to have Very other good. properties come in to be able to revalue, it's going to take at least time. So, and most banks won't, allow you to do too much to the rate or things within the first six months anyway. So um, we see it all the time, like we, we got this property at this price, now it's valued at this price, but we need to know the time difference between it to actually realize the interest rate deduction from the bank's point of view. And yeah. valuers work in the previous six months of actual sales, not what's actually listed or actually going through the process. Right. Yeah. Because I see that all the time where it's like, this is clearly, you know, X dollars. And they're like, well, we, we got to look back a little bit further than that because this sale just happened. You just bought this property two, a month and a half ago. You can't justify, I can't justify how it's gone up $60,000 because I bought it well. That's why. So, so the um, definition, what, what's the definition of the market value? Mm -hmm. What it's someone's so actually market. willing to pay for it. Yeah. Like yeah. that's. Yeah. So then we only get the only conversation we get into with bank valuers at the bank is that it's undervalued versus what we've offered. But then we're trying to get the value up so we can get this interest rate down so we can get our borrowing capacity up so we can go again. But yeah. that's why we take the stairs, not the elevator. What about when we change the fundamental structure of the dwelling, when we make it a three bed, mm -hmm. one bath to a four bed, two bath or a three bed, yeah, one that's... bath to a four bed, one bath? You can do that quicker. Like it, that's... It's a fundamental well, change. Send, 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 send the value out and get him to earn his, earn his wheat bix for the morning. Yes. Yeah, yeah, literally. And that'll change the value pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. Knock it down, but, rebuild, all that sort of stuff changes the value very, very quickly. Probably, That's probably why the, own, the, the, the caveat I'll throw, and you, you may, have, may have seen this before, is where you've got, if it's, if it's like a very small four by two, that's where if you're getting a person to go out and physically inspect it, they're going to say that that four by two down the road is is 180 100, 200 square meter property this one you've got here is 120 square meter that's not a comparable property so they're going to yeah. where if it's if, it, if it's purely an avm an automatic automated valuation uh, what have you sort of seen in that um so, does the algorithm pick it up Aaron? <laughs> so, so automa automatic sure. valuations are based on not only what they're, they're based on the geography and the properties and all that stuff but it's also based on the risk factors of the type of property and the inputs that you put in as as a broker or a banker because um i've done avms on properties where i went oh i didn't think it was going to be that price so i'll redo it at a higher price and i get a higher price two two minutes later and then I go, oh, what, what can i push this one for like it's where crazy. is this going to stop yeah because yeah. your estimate if your estimate's lower than the computer guess what you're going to get your estimate yeah, yeah. um the other thing that can happen with Automated valuations is you order it, and then two seconds later, the bank goes, "No, nah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to give you an automated one. I'm going to give you a desktop." And then a, a few minutes later, it's going to, oh, "I, you know what? I was going to give you a desktop, but I'm going to send a person out because that's what we like." Um, so that's another thing that happens. There also is um, like valuation. <laughs> um, that's getting a little bit out there, but 
there, there are some, some banks that can give you really wild automated valuations, which are good for a purpose. But then if that bank becomes in, uncompetitive, refinancing to another bank may land you in lender's mortgage insurance. Ah, oh, very good point. Mm. But it gets you out of that sticky situation in the first place. So it's like... Correct. So, so what's the purpose of the lending is basically it there. The other thing I see with valuations is that um, there's, there's this thing called a relocation loan or a bridging loan. And even though this is not property investing, it does touch on the valuation part. The person listing their property might list it for a certain price. Let's say we're, we're listing it for a $2 million place and we're going to go buy a $1 million place and we just want the bank to help us move house and not have a debt at the end. Yeah. What if the value of value is at 1.4? The exiting property is now valued at 1.4, but next weekend it sells at 2. Like, the, And they couldn't get the new property because the, the poor valuation versus what the actual market is. So there's a, there's a whole range of factors there that, that the... the the value is at yeah. six months old, and then it's like what the actual market says. Yeah, yeah wow, interesting. Um, we've, we've, we've gone any deep. other any other tips and tricks that you've seen to get a better valuation from from people changing the fundamental structures? The the main one I can think of, but I, and, I don't. And know. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buying a market that's growing and then wait, <laughs> wait for that sucker. Because ultimately, it's not about like one thing I've realized through my investing is that it's not about what you think it's worth. It's not about what what um, the market thinks it's worth. When you own an investment property that's a long term buy and hold, the most important number is what the valuer values that property. And the best way to move what the valuer thinks is to move it into a different sphere. Like we're buying a property. Um, for a client, we're paying three hundred and ninety thousand um, dollars. The the typical market value for a for a three bed one bath property is uh, four hundred and ten thousand. Uh, the typical value for a four bed one bath, a uh, four bed two bath, well four bed in general, is like four hundred and seventy. So all we need to do, they already have on RP data. It says three bed one bath, but the person who bought the property. They turned that bedroom, they turned the garage into a bedroom. They got it all done through the council and they set it all up correctly. And now that property is legally a four bed, one bath. So we're going to buy it. And then automatically after we settle, I'm going to go into RP data and say, RP data, how are you doing guys? Just letting you know, here's the pictures. This room has been converted. This is now a four bed, one bath. Please convert that into four bed, one bath, because I know that the banks are going to look at RP data, see the four bed, one bath and be like, oh, cool. There you go. There's but, your extra sixty thousand dollars for doing nothing. Let's let's add to that. Um, when you're when you're asking your broker or bank to order the valuation, tell them what you did to the property. That usually helps yeah. the valuer actually get the right valuation in place and increase the value. If you've done painting, bathrooms, kitchens, all that sort of stuff. So in addition to the RP data, let's let's tell them up front. Be be transparent about it. List it yeah. out. I've done the jip rock. I've done the painting. I've done the vanities. I've changed it from this to that, to this, to that, to this, to that. Mm. They'll go and have a look at it. It's just to trigger them to have the right valuation. The, the other one that I've found really interesting, even for my own personal um, owner occupied property, is that we built the property with a fifth, fifth bedroom, which on the plans was called an office. So the original valuer that did, when we went to refinance to do a investment property, the original valuer had the original plans and couldn't ignore the fact that it was a studio or an office. So we got a different valuing firm and a different bank who did not need to need this plans. And because the, the rooms were identical, looked like a bedroom, smelled like a bedroom, it was just named the wrong way from the builder's point of view. We then got an uplift of 75 grand in two days from the bank valuer. Wow. Wow. I, I, I would just say though, you, it makes it sound too easy. Like, I, if you're no, if, if you ha, if this has not not just you, but I'm talking about Joe's example, um, yours probably maybe a little bit different. But I would say if you absolutely need this to to value up, yes, generally that will happen. But if if that's a hundred percent, if if you like are going to be in financial ruin, like I would just say like it may not happen. So so just be yeah. so the question, like generally the question, yes that that will work um but i just just want to be on the fun police i'm sorry people I'm, i am the fun police what about, like generally yes that will happen but just make sure so that just, if, just because you should get some borrowing should you really get the borrowing like just because you can should you hmm. like what what's the setup just to jump into another another question that i'm going to self-impose on myself is 
but what what's the way to plan to get a portfolio like it's not necessarily we all talk about getting the right team and the, the goals and, and and all that sort of stuff but we got to think about like do you have your financial personal life buffers in place like if something happened health wise something happened to the house you're in do you have those Very buffers in place right mm -hmm. then then the next buffer you need is this is the really i i can get it down to the t when someone buys an investment property is do you have the financial buffers in place post the purchase of your investment property or did you just pour all this into it because i can potentially guarantee you that a lot of the, a major percent of the time your direct debit out of your home loan is probably going to happen two or three days before you get your rental income in <laughs> right it's so how are you going to float that? that how are you going to float that repayment um, what if you had to kick the tenants out to get it as vacant possession and then you get the tenants in and then you've got a direct debit and you're trying to find then then you or your tenant goes and then you, for the next two or three months with all the adjustments of finding the tenant and leasing and all that sort of stuff comes out and then you get your good repayment back so the financial buffers in your personal life the financial buffers in your investment especially with rate uh, rent and vacancy and all that stuff and the other thing to think about is what's the variability in your income so just because mm. we can lend to you, should we lend to you? I've had many people come to me and go, I want to buy investment property. I can get the borrowing to work. But then they reveal to me that, and, and we do, and they reveal to me they're having a child. And I go, okay, cool. We can still do the borrowing on one person. But then I go, how much, how much um, savings you got? How much of this you got? Like, we're going to go to 90% on your owner occupied. We're going to go to 90% on your investment. I, I don't think I'm the broker for you. I think you need to rethink this situation. Yeah, a little bit too big of a risk. What buffers do you Bigger see? Risk. Like, tip, like, is there a, is there an amount where you see people are like comfortable and and and, and it kind of works? Like, I, I talk to a lot of investors, and uh, it's so variable for so many different. At least from my perspective or what I see, it's so variable. I see some people so scared having these massive buffers. Like, I had someone who had four hundred grand just sat there. He's like, no, no, that's my buffer. I was like, okay, very interesting. How many properties, like how much debt do you have? He's like, you know, it was like one and a half, two million. And he's like, that's my buffer and I'm not going to put them. Like, cool. That's uh, like, do you see, do you see like a commonality or a trend? So uh, I don't, I, the, so I see the person as a person and whatever their buffer is, we just work with it obviously because we're a, a provider for that. The, the, the buffer that I, I typically see anywhere so on the lower end, some people might want 20 or 50 grand. Um, some people may feel comfortable less. Like it is really from a personal thing. It's about oh, what you single parents, kids um, uh, at the end of life, you know, your journey, wherever it is, the, 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 the amount of savings you have for your personal needs is different. For, for an investment property, there's probably more of a calculation you can do. Um, so do for it. So a buffer is a cash amount of money you have in reserve for an emergency. Um, so there's a lot of equations out there in your personal life. Maybe it's three months of your actual living expenses and repayments to debts. Um, that there's one school of thought out, out there. If you go on the Google, um, investment properties are a little bit more calculated. Um, Joe and uh, other people that do property have cash flow forecasts and stuff. So you can potentially cash flow and mitigate and put in um some sort of buffer for a few repayments and vacancy and stuff like that you can calculate that a little bit more whether rates go up or down otherwise um so there's a lot of personal buffer calculators and budget people and things out there about how much you should have in savings and then with the property you can get a little bit more strategic and calculated and about how much you need um but don't don't go below an actual month repayment because you're pretty well going to have a direct debit before you get your rent yeah, it, it really is. It, like everyone's asking, you know, what's a conservative amount? What's a recommended amount? How many weeks? How many months? It comes down to you. Like how comfortable are you with that amount of debt? Because it is going to limit how much borrowing and property you can acquire. Because if you're saying, oh, well, I need a minimum of $100,000 of, of debt. Okay, cool. Well, that means you need to save $100,000, stop that, then save another $100,000 to be able to then buy, a, buy an investment property. Um, and then that's that's comfortable for some people some people are a lot less comfortable you know with twenty thousand dollars there's some there's someone here that has a little uh little cheeky fifty dollars <laughs> uh, a little aggressive <laughs> aggressive buffer there uh, <laughs> yeah. uh so okay, that, cool. 
Does it yeah. does it need to be in the offset or can it be liquid funds? Oh, that's cool. an interesting cool. question because I thought they were the same thing. <laughs> no, what, what uh, and and the context of the person making this comment is that he's talking about like shares, basically shares or other oh, liquid okay. investment assets. And I, I, I personally, and other people, whoever is going to make their own decision, I would want it in because the problem with like what happens if tomorrow the market tanks eight percent and your hundred k go or your ten k goes to whatever it is goes to sort of nine thousand two hundred or whatever it is. And and then and then you needed to like I would personally want that in cash, but everybody's got to make their own decision what they're comfortable with. I'm not saying the so money. This is, that. So this is this is the interesting thing about um, we we need to be having uh, having some education, checking it all out, understanding what our personal requirements are, um, and like having a bit in investments, a bit in cash, and a bit in this. Like get get the advice on that, get the education on that from a pure lending point of view, like. You, you can save money with your savings by redraw and offset, especially in the right circumstances. Well, and here's here's a question, Jeff, because you were chatting about shares. Um, there's a question here that says, um, mm -hmm. uh, do we release equity for phased investment? Exa uh, example is a dollar cost averaging to invest in ETFs. Will setting up a linked offset with a released equity be a, uh, be a good idea? Is that... <laughs> So, so I've done a I've done a few equity releases for for investments outside of property, but yeah, uh, we're we're in Oz property here. So when when I do equity releases for other types of investments other than property, it is usually with um, it's either the bank restricts it to I need a statement of advice from a financial planner, or I need to potentially usually I have a financial planner as a client that I am releasing equity under their professional status. And that usually helps the lender. So it's not just a, uh, released for other types of assets other than property. It's quite interesting that we have an unregulated market in property and and say other other assets. But and the banks will will lend thirty year mortgages on property, but they will never do that on a margin loan. So it's a, a very interesting thought to think about. But diversification of your your investments is always a thing that is touted on by all regulators. So. Yeah, and also for me, it's like okay, my interest. So the way I the way I think about leveraging into shares, right? Because I'm, what this person is saying: Do I pull fifty thousand dollars of equity out of my investment property that's just grown fifty thousand dollars, and then put that into ETFs? And an ETF is an exchange age of sorry, exchange traded fund, which is just a pool of of shares. So do I take my fifty thousand dollars out and pull it put it into shares? Um, the the thing for me is. You need to be, when your interest rate is at 6.5%, you need to be able to guarantee to yourself that, that those shares are going to grow above 6.5% because you're, you're paying 6.5% on that, on that money once you drop it into the ETFs. So plus, it's like, plus, you're, paying, plus you're paying tax if you're, if you're yeah. making dividends whatever plus it you're as well. On, so. on the game. Yes, there's franking credits, all it? that it's, stuff as well. No, don't talk about frank. Um, Frank, don't we talk don't talk about. about no. <laughs> not to say that anyway. not to say that ETFs aren't a great <laughs> idea and you should shouldn't diversify. But I'm just like, it's six and a half percent. You're going like, is your share going to get like crypto? Sure, go do that, and like, it's going to go incredibly high or it's going to go incredibly low. Like, it's all a risk, and you've just got to identify that when you pull equity out of an investment property, it is going to be a percentage. You are going to guaranteed pay a six and a half. Where are you going to put that to get that return? Um, what what are we? What's that called? Um, the risk risk rate of return is that what it's called? Opportunity yeah. cost, maybe. Opportunity, yeah. cost, Oppor rate opportunity rate. cost is sort of about getting in. Risk rate of return, I think that's where I get into. But that sort of diversifies out of out of property a bit. It's still a legitimate way to use equity, but usually you'll need to be a professional or a statement of financial advice to be able to do. It. Right, but I can't. Well, I mean, I can just withdraw equity. I mean, I just withdraw you can. equity. There, there's ways. There's ways to withdraw equity without question, obviously. Um, but if you're going to disclose that it's for investments for ETFs, it has rules. So when you're talking to your mortgage broker, if you do want to withdraw it out for equity, do not tell them in writing. <laughs> uh, <that you> could... <laughs> no, it, it's best to be fully upfront and disclose to the mortgage broker so we can Absolutely. actually shape your plans to be able to get to where you want to go. Yeah, and that's where you need it. You need to know where you want to go. So talking about a, a specific granular thing about ETFs or 
or even taking equity out for properties. It's about, okay, what is the outcome here that we're going to be playing the ultimate for? goal, baby. Yeah. Okay. I want to get to the key mm. questions that we need to ask a mortgage broker to be able to get an investment savvy mortgage broker. Because like we said at the beginning of this show, there are non-investment. The first mortgage broker I went to just down the road, um, just down the road of where I live. And he said, mate, I'm going to get you the best place. And he told me about all these investment locations. He's like, mate, I love it. Oh, my, the, you know, there's invest. Oh, do you own any? Oh, no, no, I don't own any investment properties, but I'll tell you all the great ones. And then uh, he's like, yeah, I need to get you a loan. I'll get you the best rate, absolute best rate. And uh, yeah, waste of time. Um, he got me a terrible loan. It didn't have an offset account. It didn't have all these extra things that I needed as an investor. Um, so how do we find these strategic mortgage brokers or investment savvy mortgage brokers out there? Should we run the ad, run run our last ad before oh, we do yeah, that? Before we do we that, that, before we do that, got to tease gonna, the audience. There's going to be some tease, cracking questions coming up. Tease and tickle, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a special announcement from the master of commercial property investing, Steve Polisi. I love commercial property. Get ready to have your minds blown as Steve is back and he's got some pretty exciting news for us. Steve is unleashing his second sensational book upon the world. And get this, for the Oz Property Investors members out there, he's giving it away absolutely free. Mm -hmm. Yep, 100% free. Yep. 100% free for all property enthusiasts who want to learn and grow on their commercial property investing journey. But he's also added a little extra chili to make this deal even spicier. With this free book, you'll also receive a complimentary one hour strategy session with the man himself. Imagine a full 60 minutes with Steve's commercial and property genius dedicated to helping you master the intricate dance of commercial property investing. And who better to dance with the man who looked better than Patrick Swayze in Dirty Dancing? I don't know about that. Want to grab this offer? It's super easy. If you're live right now, click the link in the comments and secure it today. If not, grab your device, open up the browser, head over to policyproperty.com, look for the book page and grab your free copy of Steve's latest masterpiece. And when you're checking out, make sure to use the exclusive code OZPROP to secure the free book and also your free one hour strategy session. My only concern with this offer is that Steve's going to have to turn it off soon as he can only do so many sessions. So if you want to secure your spot, do so today. Oh, I nearly passed out there. Yeah, oh. very good. <laughs> so on, without, I think we, we've built this up about the questions. I, I think that they are, we're talking about this before and they are fantastic. So should we, should somebody bring them up? So, or how do we want to what? unpack these no, questions? No, we'll just go through them one, one by one, one by I reckon. One. So, how do we find an investment savvy mortgage broker? What are the key questions that we need to be asking here, Aaron? Yeah, so um, let, let's go for a juicy one first. Uh, do you have, uh, so it's me asking a broker. So okay, yes. Joe, pretend to be a broker. It's called role playing, baby. Yep. Do it. All right, so Joe, um, is there, um, do you have a strategy to assist me with which lenders to go first and how to match them to all areas of my desire to own property in my personal name in a trust structure and in a super fund god that's quite a question yeah yeah so that's a you want an all-rounder to be able to keep building out your property portfolio so that's a it's a good question um all right the easy question um uh, well, why is, it, hang on, why is it, yeah, what's yeah. the answer? What do we want people, what do we want them to say back to yeah, that? I, so, I think we need oh, to okay. unpack, particularly right, for the, go, you go. have That's a strategy fine. for which lenders I should go to first. How do you factor in trust? What was it? Trust SMSF? So, do, do you have a strategy to assist which lenders to go to first and how yeah. to match them to all areas of me owning property in personal trust structures and self money super funds? Do you have the availability of products and the knowledge to go to which lenders first? writing these in the comments so people can see them. Mm. Uh, and if you're on YouTube, um, yeah. Go to the Facebook page. Go to Facebook. <laughs> Join up, listen in, jump in. Okay, so why is that important? What what, what answers, so, like, because if someone said that to a broker down the street, he'd be like, uh, 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 I don't know. Um, what, so what are the kind of correct answers why, we want to Why is it important? Like, how far do you want to? So this is the goal. Like, you can use a, use a, a non investment level broker, but you might be doing more personal ownership. 
Um, do you have a goal that you want to have it in a, in a trust? Do you want to have um, investments in your super? How do you want to manage the borrowing capacity cap, so to speak? Um, do you want to invest time and effort to build the relationship with a broker that can help you over the long term and multi-layer your uh, easily understandable multi-property property portfolio strategy out to keep, keep it building, keep it going? And you need all three areas of investment to do that. You don't have to take all three areas. You can make a judgment call on the broker yourself Yeah. for your goal. Okay. I like it. What's another good mm -hmm. question to ask a yeah. broker? When oh, finding a home. Someone's Ooh, jumped right. in here. No property in trust. There you go. Very interesting. Unpack if that. If you don't if want you property want in trust, great, great question to get an answer. I don't do trust. You could get a broker that says, I don't do trust. Like, how cool is that? You can screen a broker that way if you want. Oh, okay. No property in trust. I get it. Okay, cool. But you do help people that have trust to structure yeah, that. Absolutely. So uh, I can help in all levels. I'm not trying to promote myself here a little bit, trying to help people find their broker for themselves. Yes. Um, okay. Next question. It's another cool uh, one. Uh, when finding a home loan, do you just go for the cheapest cost application fee, whatever, and cheapest interest rate? So the responses you might find yeah. here is um, if they're always going for the cheapest cost and cheapest interest rate, what other policies are they missing for you to extend your borrowing capacity? Uh, if you're going for the cheapest cost and cheapest interest rate, how about you could potentially do it yourself if it's just your own place? So do you really need to go through uh, things there? Like cheapest cost and cheapest interest rate might be broker Google. It could be... If you go to a broker and you get a rate and a cost and an interest rate associated with achieving your goal, not, and if there's more than one lender, they will bash up those lenders to make sure you get the cheapest cost out of that set of lenders. And then when you go and watch the TV at nighttime and you can get a 5.5% rate and you're getting 6.2 or 6.7, you actually know why you're getting it because you're achieving a goal about getting in the market versus staying out. Very good point. Very, very good point. It's it's kind of like the old age question, maybe not too old age, but do I save more? Like I had this conversation with an investor. Um, I'm looking to buy in a very hot, Joe, I'm looking to buy in a very hot market, a very hot area right now that's growing incredibly quickly. I only have a 90% lend. Should I save up and buy a 20% lend? Like should I save up the rest of my cash to get to 20% so I can avoid LMI, lenders, mortgage insurance? Um, and I guess that, that was the question that was asked to me. So I'll give my answer. Um, the, the answer was, well, do you think you can save as fast as it, the market is growing? And do you still have faith in the market by the time that you get into it, that it would have shifted? Um, so it's like, for me, it's like, if you can get into the market as soon as you can get into the market as soon as you can. And lenders mortgage insurance is one of these things, which is like six, seven, eight thousand $8,000 that is capitalized into the loan. Uh, but for me, I used I used lenders mortgage insurance for my my purchase, and I was willing to pay the banks that because it allowed me to get into a property that grew faster than that. If it's going into a slow market, I would say no. If you're going into a slow market, just you know wait it out and see. But um, yeah, I mean, what are your paid, thoughts I, on that? I paid I paid mortgage insurance on. I probably may have paid it twice. One to get out of my first issue, one to get in my next um, property, and then my first investment property, I did mortgage insurance too. So. Yeah, they loved me during that phase. Now they don't <laughs> love me because I can do it differently. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. What questions? What's, what's our next one? Um, so is uh, so asking a broker is there um, is there a borrowing capacity cap? Uh, if so, how can I manage this so that I can continue to get loaned money from lenders? Okay, what's the answer so, to that? Because hmm. so um, it's 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 not asking whether there is or isn't a cap it's how it's how the cap if the cap is there you as the borrower are getting some tips and tricks and strategies in the lending space to be able to manage your borrowing capacity for the long term not just to cap it out and then the broker keeps telling no you can't buy anymore no you can't buy anymore or the bank says no you can't buy anymore but if you told me that i could do it differently earlier on i wouldn't have this problem oh yeah but we didn't go through that question does that make yeah. sense? Crystal clear. 
Love it. Any questions about that, chuck them in the comments. Okay, next question. Let's do it. Um, you could do the the, the simple one, like um, what does the onboarding, like how do I engage you? How What information do I have to give you? What, what analysis do you do? Um, do you just give me my borrowing capacity and that's it? Do you actually give recommendations of what we can do? How, how do you how do you onboard me? How do I engage your services? Um, what hoops are you going to put me through? Mm. Um, it's not okay. necessarily that you don't want to engage anyone. It's just then you know, as a borrower, what you need to do to be able to get to the end goal. One of the one of the questions I have is is um, how do you know if your if your broker is kind of handling too many loans and they and and like they can't service the amount of like the volume. Like, is there any indicators that you can, it's kind of like property management, right? Like if a property manager has 200 rental listings, it's too much volume for one property manager. Is there a way to do that for brokers? Like, can you figure that out? Yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, I'm going to, we, I've been there. I've been on the other side. I've been there again. I've been on the other side in regards to having too much on the plate and too less on the plate and too much on the plate. Um, as a, as a broker, you've got to smooth that out as best as possible. So obviously that comes down to the individual broker's goal for their own company, but how do you check that from you wanting to engage them? Um, asking questions about how long is it going to take, uh, being crystal clear with you providing, um, providing what your timing expectations is. So if I was a borrower engaging myself, um, you would, I would ask, okay, I have an expectation that I need to have my pre-approval, for example, by the 20th of March. 20th of March being a, my favorite day because it's my birthday. So I need I need you, Mr. Broker, to be able to achieve that. And the broker might say, no, I've got, I've got too much on. I'm not going to be able to meet that requirement. What do you... So it's about having that discussion about what is your clear timing expectations. Yeah. And, what should we expect for a loan? Yeah. Like what, yeah. what, what is a time frame that is is reasonable? Mm. So there's two, two or three different ways to look at that. You, Everyone knows that there's a, uh, when you press the submit button, there's a timeline to the credit manager and some bank valuations to do. What is, what is the unknown is the um, time of providing the documents to the broker and engaging their services to getting the loan submitted. And that's where the variabilities can come in from, from uh, staffing through to the complexity of yourself. Like if you've got half dozen trusts and lending and multi-property entity, business lending, and and being self-employed in uh, half a dozen entities, that the time from you giving the information to the time to submission is going to be longer than if you're going for your first home or your first property investment. So what's the timeline? If you're a standard employee looking for your first property, um, once you've sent in your documents, that is your, your control of timing, then it's about... Um, uh, then the the broker should come back and say, it's, I've got a few in front of you. I'm going to get to you on this date, or I've got time now. I can I can punch it out now, or I've got a team of brokers around me that I'm. When you engage me as a business, you engage the brokers. So if you were coming to me and I do a call with you, you're not engaging Aaron. You're engaging the the strategic force of four other brokers and five six support staff. Yeah, and. Um... I guess one of the things is around like the the team. How do you find out if someone's because like like in 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 my business, people want to deal with me, um, mm -hmm. and I guess how do you know that you're not going to be put on to somebody? Yeah, other people that, <laughs> that are not necessarily. I don't know. How do you how do you how do you do I with guess that? that kind, of, kind of comes down to the communication or the broker. So, so there's there's always going to be if you if you are finding your ninja broker, there's going to be a team behind them. There, there's not many investment level or strategic brokers that don't have a team behind them to be able to get the complexity and deal with some analysis that's a little bit more funky than say um, having uh, having not a team. You can you can not have a team and still be an investment level broker. Go for it because that that is there too, but what what it is is it's about like for me i want to build a business so i can grow a portfolio too so that comes into it so how do you check if they've got a team website's a great thing how do you manage if you're feeling like you're palmed off to someone else which is the thing that you don't want to some some people don't want to feel that some people are comfortable with that um what 
what I do is when you engage me, I am also not only the person that may talk to you first off when you come into the business, I'm also one of the key lending strategists to help collaborate with the team. We have daily meetings on, on the deals that are on the table to help collaborate and take, get, get the shortcut through to get the timing back on track, to get things going, to make sure that the communication to the client is where it's up to. Now, have I, I, there is, um, there is times that it can get busy and times that it gets a bit lighter on. Yeah. No, cool. Makes, makes perfect sense. Um, okay, cool. What, what about, um, what other questions have we got? What are some other core ones to, to ask your broker to uncover? Oh, you so it's like you can get a bit interviewee style approach. You can go, what sets you apart from other mortgage brokers? How does your unique expertise or approach align with my specific needs and goals? What are, you, what are your weaknesses even? Like what do you, and, and say what well, weakness is that I've not made, I, don't, I, work too, I work too hard. <laughs> so it's just a, you, you're just trying to gauge what, what you want to do. You don't even have to, you can ask that question. You don't have to ask the question. Th those questions are like, you're just trying to find who you're going to gel with in the end with any professional. Sometimes you don't have to ask them lots of questions. Sometimes you do. Um, but understanding, um, specific expertise is like, for example, there is uh, tens of thousands of mortgage brokers out there. If you're interviewing a mortgage broker for an investment property and they turn out to just do asset finance, that's an interesting question you've got to ask yourself. Um, if you're interviewing and you've got a broker that specializes in just refinances or mum and dad, um, owner occupied investor or self-employed versus PIYG, th there's a whole range of specialties out there that brokers have gone into. So you're just trying to unpack how that expertise is going to match to your goals and if you're asking that question without knowing your goals you're probably not asking the right question yeah another another important thing i think is invaluable is to get along with the person i think this is is this is poignant for your entire team your entire property mm -hmm. team is i see a lot of people like oh well no i'm going with that person because you know they've got the be the, the best facebook ads well it's like no, no, no. Can you communicate to that person and say, I do not want that loan because of this, this, and this? Like, can you actually sit down with this person and say, hey, can you just explain this to me a little bit more? Because I'm a bit, I'm a bit silly. I like to be, I like to be the silliest person in the room full of smart people so that I can, that I can understand. So you've got a, your communication style, other people, completely different. They don't like to be silly. They like to know, you know, this, this, and this, and that's going to be taken care of. Um, so you've got to match your communication style as an individual to the broker that you're getting because Aaron's an unreal broker. Um, but if you if you don't get along with his style, it's it's not going to be a fit. You're going to have a conversation with him. You're like, because right. someone there was another comment someone wrote here. How do you say no if a broker? Uh, how do you say no to a broker if you don't want to proceed after the initial call? That's great. You've done the initial say call. No. You've realized there's not a fit. <laughs> Just send them in. I say sorry. I don't think there's a fit. I'm going with someone. I've already gone with someone else. Um, I think that that is super. Important I wouldn't even say that person. because then they say. Well, I just say, look, at, at this stage, I, I'm not. I don't think. I don't think I want to work. Like we're, at this stage, I'm gonna. <laughs> I don't want to work. I'm, I don't want to work. I don't want to work. <laughs> no, 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 you've got to no, work. Like, yeah. Obviously, would that, but, but I so, wouldn't say I've gone with somebody else because I've said that to people and they've said, well, what is the other person? And they get all defensive. It's like, well, it's, it's not, not it's my business, man. You. It's just me. Like, uh, yeah, it's. Yeah. It's me. It, it's, it's, it's not you. This is the reason why I'm not yep. going not, with you. <laughs> no, no. I suppose there's yeah. two, 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 a couple of aspects there. Though. Like t you can tell them up front. You can let them know. Um, if, if you look at any sort of type of marketing, when you when when you don't say no to someone or you don't say yes to someone, how many marketers come at you if you don't answer the question yes or no? Because if you say no, they stop. If they say yes, you proceed. So. Um, how do you sell, tell your broker that, that you've had, don't want to proceed after an initial call? Um, you can politely send them an email. You can do a text message. You don't have to face them on a Zoom call again or get out of your comfort zone. Just let them know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't need to be. But also, don't don't string people along. It's just like anything. If you if you needed someone to do something and they they think you're there to, you know, you're interested in their service, 
don't ignore them. Hey, like if they're calling you and saying, hey, where, where are you at? Let's just say, look, I'm not interested. Oh, cool. That makes perfect sense. Great. Now I don't need to waste my time mm -hmm. on someone that's not interested in my service. Uh, so right. I think there's also a level as a consumer, you should be a little appreciative of, of, of that. Um, okay. Let's rattle off the rest of these questions because we've got other yep, questions yep. from the audience that are very valuable. And I don't want to skip any, don't want to skip any of these. So what, uh, let's, let's do, we don't need to go through the explanation. What are some more okay. core questions so we need to ask out? How many clients have you assisted to start, build, and manage multi-property portfolio lending? Um, uh, in a, so this one, this one comes back to this, this thing. In addition to asking you how to pref you prefer being communicated, um, could you also share some um, typical response times, uh, available meetings, or preferred contact methods, or how can how can I understand your method of communication and how I can make that smoother for you by giving you all the information? Yep. Yeah. From the yeah. Makes sense. Um, and then you can throw throw the other one in. Can you provide examples or testimonials of successful mortgage transactions where you have helped clients achieve their um, multi property portfolio or overcome challenges? Overcoming challenges is a good one. Um, this can help me understand your track record and how you will add value to me and my journey as well. Nice. Yeah. Cool. There you go. That's it. That's the list. I Solid. Know, I 10 Solid. and I went, I went to three and two and one and two. And, yeah. <laughs> Started at 10, went down to nine. And then he, he, yeah, he hit that. That's it. Love it. Okay. Yeah. There's some solid questions. Um, for me, it really just comes down to understanding if they're able to fulfill the goal that, that, that you need. So be able to educate them on the goal. Um, but first it starts with your own education um, to understand where are you looking to go? And if someone can help you into that journey and you just share where you're looking to go and have you done that before? Have you helped someone do that before? Yes. Great. Okay. Well then let's give it a, you know, and all those other questions that we mentioned. Um, okay, let's hit some of these questions up because there's a whole heap. If anyone has any questions, we are over time now. We are over time, so we do need to uh, we do we do need to jump into some of these questions. Um, so, how long after settlement is it advisable to wait before applying for another pre-approval? Great question. It is a great question. Um, do do you actually have to wait till settlement? Is another question too. So, it depends on if, if you're going to do. Uh, it depends on the control. So you can start a pre-approval after settlement the day or a day after settlement, that 20 minutes after settlement, you can start submitting again if you're going to use a different bank to what you've just settled on. If you're using the same bank to do a few multi, a few property purchases at once, you could declare all the pre-approvals up front. And so instead of going for a pre-approval of a million dollars, you could go for a pre-approval for 500 and a pre-approval for 500. And that would allow your property partner to be able to um, potentially do multiple transactions or jump into the next one as soon as possible. So if you're using one lender, then another, wait till the, you could wait till the day of settlement. If you're going with the same lender, you could probably um, front load it because you're going to have to provide the same information to do one transaction to do two. Okay. Possible, baby. Mm -hmm. Possible. Make it happen. If you want to get a new loan, you get a new loan. Um, can I drive Uber after work for six months to temporarily improve my borrowing capacity? And this let's let's roll this into any little small business venture, right? Anything that you can run on your own, like I don't know, run a market stall and and have your little pay pass machine there, and um, uh, yeah, Uber Etsy. Eats. Only for, little Etsy. Only yeah, little Etsy yeah. store. That's a good point. Yeah. So mm. how does that work? Does so, it increase my borrowing? The majority of lenders, you would say no, because the, uh, it's usually done through an ABN and it's usually considered self-employed and has all the constraints that that has. Whether you go to low-cost lenders and you need 18 months, 24 months to do it or to add that income in, um, how are you structuring it and all that sort of stuff. But um, are you making enough money to actually increase your borrowing capacity is the good question to ask with anything that you go into with only being six months. Um, most, most of the time I feel businesses need a bit more time unless it's like changing from contractor to ABN and things like that, which has some special rules out there. Okay. Another question I have so what, what is... What it can do though... Uh, go on, Jeff. There you go. What there it can go, do, mate. though, is improve your cash flow, which which we have spoiled over. There you go. To, 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 uh, yeah, really rapidly 
Yeah, exactly. What were you going to say, Joe? What's your question, man? Um, my other one was around like uh, like previous. Uh, uh, I used to be in in the sales environment, and it was a very low low sa salary. Um, so lending was quite difficult, but then a very high commission. How does the whole commission mm, um, question. and and salary kind of factor in? Yeah, yeah. And bonus so as well, because bonus, you, I mean, that's yeah. another that's another thing. Yeah, if if you change the Uber driver to say a casual worker for six months, once you've got the six months, we can put the casual income in. Then we can level up and go into the the low base high commission area. So commission and bonus are usually considered slightly different depending on the lender you go to. Some will take one hundred percent, some will take a percentage, some will want to see it over two years. So bonus yeah. typically is usually what did you get the previous year, what did you get the current year, and some will average, some will use the lower, all that nice stuff. Um, where it's commission, where you've got allowances, you've got penalty rates, you've got overtime. Some lenders will average and some lenders will want to see it over a period of time. If you are changing from one job to another, that can change the whole structure of your new job might have a slightly better base, but slightly better comms. You, you do need a bit of history on the board or to match, match a couple of um, policies up to be able to continue on using those commissions to accelerate your borrowing capacity. But you could use most lenders will use 80 percent some will use 100 percent. some will use uh, yeah that's that's how it sort of works you we always put non non-base in a different um calculator to get the year to date annualized for each specific bank interesting okay cool um what's this one this is a good question does having property in your self-managed super fund affect the borrowing power for your personal name <laughs> This one comes up. A, this one comes up a lot. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. So, so there's two little things with. So, typically, technically speaking, SMSF borrowing is isolated to super, and your personal borrowings isolated to your personal borrowing. The only caveats on that one is where you might have a payslip with salary sacrifice on it. So, where you have a payslip mm -hmm. with salary sacrifice on it, is that actually required to service your loan in your super fund? So, it's just a logical question. You have salary sacrifice on your payslip. Is that required to manage your investment loan? So how do we overcome that? That's typically because you've got a self-managed super fund. You usually have an investment accountant behind you, and that can be easily overcome because not everyone that has a loan in the super fund, um, uh, everyone that has a loan in the super fund has the opportunity to salary sacrifice without it affecting the loan as well to build up their super fund. So you need to have your accountant to help back you up when you're going for lending where you've got salary sacrifice on your payslip. Um, but technically, we don't need to look at it. Um, super and personal is all separate. Ah, nice. Um, the other question I had was uh, when we get a raise. So let's just say we're on a cruisy, mm. we're on a cruisy 80K. We, we, we've been crushing it at work. And um, you know what? There's a new spot. You know, I just, uh, I just, you know, killed off the competition. I, I'm going to get 150k. Um, like when, when you move up from a, from maybe not 100, let's just say 120. Like, how, how quickly can I get that as a borrowing capacity? Like the, the, the new uh, play, place that I work at has given me a hundred and twenty thousand dollar increase, and it's here on a piece of paper. Um, but do I have to wait for th a month, months. three months? six months to be able to go back to the bank and and go with that raise mm. so we've we've had a, a couple of case scenarios where we have um, applied for a home loan where they have the old base just to get through the timing and mm. during the timing of the application they've got their their raise they usually get a employment letter and a lot of the banks will ask for the first pace with the raise in it to be able to utilize it going forward so it's just a common sense thing. They want to know the employer is committed to it and they want to know it actually happened. That's the most restrictive thing, but um, there could be some variances on that. But usually you need to have the evidence that it's actually being paid with the employment letter that you got a raise because your year-to-date averaging would change. So if you got a raise today being March, your whole tax year has been at the old rate versus the new rate. So you've, we've just got to get the um, calculators on. Would, would, wouldn't you have though, like, like if, you, if you're assuming, uh, I assume that Joe, you'd go from a 90k base to 120k base, is that what you meant? Or, or yeah. are you talking about comms and that sort of yeah. thing? Wouldn't you just no, have no, an employment contract that says, yeah, yeah, now I'm getting paid 120k? So wouldn't that then so you just say, the well, my, my salary now is 120? 
Yeah. So my, some of them will, will do that, but a lot of them are asking for the first pay slip. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. Which you should be able to get in two weeks. Hopefully you're not paid monthly in that situation. <laughs> as long as the same oh, industry questions. as well. Same industry. Yeah, that, actually, that's a very good point. Is being on interest only for an investment property ideal? What are the pros? Of, this is a big question. What are the pros and cons of being on interest only versus principal and interest? <laughs> the pros and cons, eh? So um, banks will charge a little bit more. Um, your monthly payments a little less. Um, interest only can work for like there's a there's a couple of case scenarios to do um to, to logically think about interest only it can help you get set up in your investment property journey um it can help you build your your cash flow back up from a from paying for the investment property and then build your cash flow back up um you've got to be able to with the the con is that you you've got a lower interest rate a lower repayment whilst you've got interest only but then you've got to prepare for what happens when the interest only expires are you refinance? Are you able to eligible to qualify to refinance? Um, those sorts of things. So invest interest only could be it could be a good thing for individual circumstances for your first investment property, but it could be a, depending on what your outgoings are on your personal side, it could be something that you might want to think of your circumstances differently and pay down the debt. You could build up your deposit a bit more. You might be building a property and you're waiting for a tenant to get in. So there's a whole range of different things around investment interest only versus principal and interest and what it costs and doesn't cost to do. Unreal. Okay. Solid, mate. I'm, oh, um, mm. We just got another comment up. This has been one of the best shows for a while. Oh. I mean, a little bit of a backhand compliment, um, <laughs> kind of, you know. <laughs> But well, they must. They must have you. not seen. No, no. I, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to throw Aaron on the bus. But maybe this person hasn't watched in a couple of weeks. But because the last I two feel like or we've three had sessions, some killer have been... sessions, we've had some killer yeah, sessions on. Been, mm. and Aaron, you sessions. haven't broken the trend, mate. You haven't well, been the one to going. ruin it. <laughs> Let's wait for next week to see if they can they can keep this trend <laughs> keep go. this trend going because I feel like we've had some pretty pretty unreal sessions, um, but we're pretty much at time here, mate. We need to let you yep. get back home. Um, so, how do people get some strategic mortgage brokers like yourself in their life? Like, how do I get more Aaron into my uh, into my <laughs> eyeballs and earballs? How do we make this shit happen? Cool. So. Um... We are named Strategic Mortgage Brokers, so Strategic Mortgage Brokers, all one word, .com.au. You can book in, book in an appointment. You can fill out some details, give some pre-work before we, we get in touch with you. Um, and you can go a bit old-fashioned and just pick up the phone and give us a call. We, we have an office number. We have it manned all the time during business hours, and away we go. We get you underway. Um, yep, that's where I'm going. That's it. Okay, so if we want to have like, like – you know, I'm just starting out and in investing. Um, I'm just looking to, you know, understand what an investment broker investments. No, Jeff, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not the wrong. That's not the right one, Jeff. <laughs> That's the wrong one. Yeah, that's the wrong no. one. Um, so strategicmortgagebrokers.com. That's it. Um, what do you have to do? <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, so we just jump on the website, give you a bell, jump on a call, mate. This has been an awesome session. I think that yeah. I think a lot of people get tied up with property investing and they think it's all about the property. Ugh, mate, it's not. It's not about like the property is a big part of it. But mm -hmm. my first my my first thing is speak with your broker. Before you before you go to anyone, have a conversation with an investment savvy mortgage broker because they're going to set you up correctly um, to be able to go for that next that that next property. Um, because the goal is to make sure that this next property is not going to mess you up for the following property. Because if your goal is to build a portfolio, it's to make sure. Yeah, there it is. There, someone saying in the comments, property is a game of finance. Um, so, Aaron, you are very strategic in your approach, and um, I appreciate. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but any other kind of lasting wisdoms you want to leave the leave the team with? Um, no, um, I am participating in the world's greatest shave uh, next Tuesday, so I'll have a bald head from Tuesday onwards. So if anyone wanted to go over to my uh, find me on Facebook, it's a public post, and want to support me on that one, or see Aaron tonight has hair, and Aaron after Tuesday will have no hair. Are you going beard so gone as well? 
No, no. Uh, my youngest daughter has forbid me from doing that. I move. Yeah, I, I would. I would say keep the beard. You know, some up top, some none up top, some some down by a lot. Yeah. But really, really good cause. Let's um, it's it's one of those things that can property investment can help with those life events like cancer and stuff. But let's um, Jesus. see if we get yeah. defeated at the same time by just chopping the hair off. Yeah, and also any donation that you make to this cause is tax deductible. Yep, it doesn't come to me. It goes to the Leukemia Foundation. Well, no, but also you get a tax deduction on being a generous little, there you go. little bugger. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, unreal, mate. Thank you very much cool. for taking the time to run through this. Jeff, any final words? I just want to say thank you for helping each and every one of us in our investing journeys because you've, you've spent a good amount of time helping helping myself as well. So I appreciate that and, and running me through sort of more advanced complex. You obviously don't have kids. <laughs> I don't know what makes yeah. it obvious. But no, no, thank, thank you very thank you very much, Aaron. I appreciate your time and, and you're, you're great and you're always willing to have a chat and help out, which is uh, not always the case with some brokers and just some professionals. Some people are just too busy. So I appreciate that and, and good on you. No, yep. I'm too busy not to have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> I've got puns tonight. It's great, isn't it? We did do a newsletter with Aaron as well. So if you do want to, uh, if you do, we did a great newsletter. What was, what was the purpose of that? It was um, so that you can negotiate the yeah. best rate with the brokers, uh, sorry, with the banks to be able to achieve, um, you know what, we don't need um, to be spending crazy money. So that's in that's the right. comments there. Um, join that, do that. And uh, buy that next let's go buy a property. Absolutely. Let's do it.